What's up guys, welcome back to the Imperfect Swing Golf Podcast. We're here for the 2021 first episode with the 15-year-old professional golfer, Kiara. I'll leave it up to you just to give people a little bit of a short intro as to who you are and and how you've you know basically come up to this stage in, in your career. Hi, by the way, my name is Kiara Noya. Um, I'm a 15-year-old, now professional golfer. Um, I've been playing golf since the pretty young age of three to four years old, so now mm, almost... 13 years actually um so it's been a long journey and hopefully lots of exciting things coming up and yeah you you're only 15 years old you know the question that a lot of athletes when they reach a professional level is did you always know that golf was your career path um for you were there any other i know your parents were quite keen golfers and that's where you kind of picked up the game were there any other things that interested you, you know, during this 12 year span? I mean, obviously you're quite young, so there, there must have been a few things that kind of piqued your interest. Yeah, I mean, I've definitely always been a very sporty child. I've always really loved competing and exercising and being out in nature. So I think I'll sort of always tick those boxes and the competitiveness and the individuality of it is just really special. So for me, it was always golf. Honestly okay. speaking, um, I did have some other sports growing up, so I played a bit of netball, horse riding, you know, just running or whatever it was. But um, yeah, golf was always the focus. And, you know, turning pro at a, a young age like this, has it kind of sunk in yet? Do you, uh, do you feel like you're riding this? It's almost like a, a high that you're kind of riding right now in, in everything that's happening for you. Yeah, I mean... Professional golf, you know, it is a different, it, it is a very different league to amateur golf, but um, sometimes I must admit, I forget. <laughs> so sometimes I'll just make a joke and be like, oh, that was, you know, good enough for a professional golfer. And I'll be like, oh, wait, I am professional. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, it's a journey and hopefully those highs and peaks will continue. But it's an exciting time and I'm just looking forward to the future, to be honest. And the decision to turn pro, I, I know your your last round as an amateur was at the Moonlight. Um, did COVID accelerate that decision? I know because normally you would be playing all these amateur events and obviously with COVID cancelling a lot of those events. Um, and then you got to play in some of the LET Access Series events. Is that where you saw your game at the level of I can be professional? Is that kind of what accelerated this whole journey? Yeah, I think that that probably sums it up pretty well. Um, COVID did cancel a lot of things for me, especially 2020. 2021 season probably was somewhat more difficult because I was sort of dealing with a new environment. I was in a different place. So travel was even more difficult at that point. Um, so there's LET access and might sort of expose me to this new tour, new environment that I sort of grew up to love. And it exposed me to a setting that I sort of, preferred over amateur golf and it hopefully you know showed me that I can compete and I'm ready to compete and it just sort of it finalized that new step in my life and it it maybe it did speed things up a little bit but I think realistically speaking it would have happened sooner or later anyway um, but it's an opportunity that I will forever be thankful for and it's a great step to take what what kind of change for you on the mental side you know from competing in amateur events to you know playing let access like there was that obviously that adjustment period for you but i mean there must do you think there was like a massive shift in the way you looked at the game maybe more aggressive as a pro because it's kind of like make or break you you're obviously playing for your a living now you know that's it's a different aspect completely um I think the 2021 season as a whole, even when I was still playing these events as an amateur, I think it was just a season of growth, um, both mentally, physically, you know, swing wise. But um, I sort of highlighted the season to be my season to improve mentally. Um, so I sort of prepared myself for that transition since basically January 1st of 2021 and almost sort of dating back to 20, end of 2020 moonlight. Um, so I was basically just sort of preparing myself for those steps and just working on my mentality, going into tournaments, competing, being secure in myself, having confidence in my ability and all of that, um, which of course is difficult to sort of do what it's easy to talk about, but it's more difficult to translate yeah. into reality. So, um, it took me a few events. I must admit, you know, it takes you time and experience to sort of get to new, get to know these new environments and pressures, but 
you know, a lot of people do struggle, especially transitioning from amateur golf to professional golf. I must admit I had a pretty easy transition, I think, just because I was already playing those exact same events just as an amateur. But in my head, I was already playing as a professional. So I don't think it was too extreme for me, but I know it can be very difficult. And, you know, getting those LET event invites was also like another step and another addition of pressure that I sort of had to deal with. But I think I, I coped with it pretty well. And, you know, it's something that I need to improve on even more going into the future as pressure and tournaments increase. So it's just, like I said before, it's a journey and, you know, it's something that you're always going to need to stay on top of. And you mentioned a new environment and obviously with a new environment comes an entirely new group of people that you're surrounded by. Um, what was the general kind of reception to you turning pro at such a young age from other professionals, um, you know, on the LET and LET access? How did they kind of take, did they take you in? Did it kind of feel like a welcoming, um, you know, space for you? And did that also maybe contribute to some comfort uh, on, on course? Yeah, I mean, I think everyone so far has been very welcoming and it's been a very nice environment to sort of develop in and grow up in in that sense. And, you know, it's something that golf is a very individual sport. So I think realistically speaking, even if necessarily they hadn't been the most inviting, I think I would have still been very happy about making that step. And I think I would have still been confident in who I am in my decision. So, you know, it's part of it and I'm happy to have received that reaction. But, you know there's up and downs in all relationships of that kind. So, you know, golf's individual. And, you know, talking about pros, did you consult, you know, making the decision, did you consult anyone in the, the professional space or was it kind of just something that you spoke within your, your inner circle, your closer, you know, family and, and coaches, or did you kind of get some, some advice from some of the professionals who have already kind of been there and done that? Um, I mean, I must admit, I sort of have this, blessing by itself being able to be surrounded by such great players here and by you know people coming to compete for those european tour ladies european tour events you see them a lot more and you are able to ask questions and sort of see your decision through their eyes or you know part through their experiences but i think the main driving force behind that decision was just between me and my team and my family um you know my coaches i think were suspecting it before even i really realized it um but it was sort of something. So when I said it and I was like, you know what, I want to do it. They weren't necessarily surprised because I think <laughs> the minute they heard that I was going to be getting and playing on the LET access as an amateur even, I think they already sort of saw that transition happen and saw sort of the increase in passion and skill in the sense of putting 100% into everything I do. And that layer of intricacy sort of, increased over those few months so I think everyone sort of saw it coming but it was definitely sort of a team decision I made sure to you know consult my team because they have had experience working with players they have yeah. you know worked with people on tour so I think they had a very good judgment of my character and I think their opinion and their input was very beneficial and you know you've you I suppose at this young age you've already got quite a nice group of um, supporting sponsors you know you've got Titleist, Footjoy and you're obviously based at um, Jamaira. How, you know, and you've always been quite a social media savvy player, even as, you know, the, ten, the tender age of like 15 years old. How has that also provided that avenue, you know, because that's kind of your brand, you know, that's who you are. Has that also just helped you kind of um, cement these partnerships with these big brands and big names? I think, you know, my following is something I can be incredibly grateful for. You know, a lot of people don't have that opportunity a lot of the time. And, you know, every single person that follows me really does help. You know, every yeah. person that does support me really makes a big difference in that sense. And, you know, just having that support, knowing that there's people still rooting for you can make a big difference, whether that is with sponsorships or whether it's, you know, going into a tournament, you're knowing that people do believe in you. And it's sort of a comforting feeling sometimes. Um, yes, you know, it adds a little bit of pressure at times too, but, you know, over the last few years, you sort of deal with that and you come to terms with it. Um, but, you know, social media, especially during these times now and during these social media years, in a sense, it's, be it's becoming more and more involved, especially in sport. So it's something that you sort of have to accommodate and something that 
you do entertain because it does make a big difference in those senses, whether it's even, you know, some nowadays you can even get invites based on, based on sponsors. So there's there's big changes happening. And I think it's great having a big following and bringing light to female golf in that sense, because we don't get the TV coverage that some, you know, men do. So being able to sort of showcase female golf and showing that the, the skill and the talent out there is, is really special. And, you know, I hope that my page and my account sort of is a little sneak peek into what you sort of see out on tour. And you mentioned that 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 whole kind of, um, you know, using it as an avenue because you guys don't get the, the attention that men's golf gets. Is that also something that you take into account as to what to share and how to share it? Um, you know, like I think your your latest one of your latest posts about the footing experience you had with Titleist. I think that's something we don't really get to see on the ladies' side too much. But for instance, we'll see Rory getting fitted out by TaylorMade, and they do they go out of their way and they they get like commercial value out of it. So is that something important to you? Like you always kind of you know thinking strategically, what would my audience want to see? Yeah, of course. You know, there's I think. A lot of people, especially now that I've turned professional, are very interested on life on tour and, you know, what it's like with the support from Titleist, you know, what they do, what the processes they go through to help a player. And, you know, especially with that recent post, Titleist has been a supporter of mine for a long time now, actually. So it's always really nice to sort of give back and sort of showcase the amazing things they do for their players and showcase the intricacy of what they do and how hard they work to sort of give and make available to us the best equipment and clubs available to us so you know it's it's difficult to say that i i plan out the content content i do because a lot of the time you know i'm traveling and i try and you know showcase events i'm playing and practice but also trying to sort of change the perception of women's golf because a lot of the time you know people when they think women's golf they think putting short game short distances with drivers so exactly you'll see a lot of my content is a little different from that sometimes sometimes my page gets a little driver orientated because i'm always trying to showcase that there is something out there where there's you know women's golf is changing in that sense players are getting longer stronger so it's a cool thing to give people insight on and hopefully people enjoy that content i mean if they don't you know give me feedback um, but it's something that's it, it gives you pride to sort of post and it's nice seeing that feedback from them as well saying you know it's great seeing women's golf being showcast in that way and you mentioned uh being driver orientated with some of the content la- lately i think uh if i remember correctly your swing speeds like roughly 106 if i remember correctly is that somewhere around there yeah so it just depends you know how far i'm how hard i'm swinging it you know because i can i can sort of go up to 110 um will the ball go straight no (laughs) can i hit the ball somehow yes um i think when i'm out on the course when i'm you know maybe doing my fitting for example i'll be from like 104 to 106 um i've heard people say you swing it a little bit faster on the golf course so that might actually be something interesting to explore but from what I'm aware of, my sort of go-to comfortable swing speed would be 104 to 106. That's sort of what I find myself going back to. That's sort of my go-to speed. It's sort of where all my numbers are based on. You know, that's where I maximize accuracy and distancy together. And it's a nice little harmony of numbers. <laughs> and you mentioned, um, you know, it depends where you are. You've, at this age, you've already stayed in three different countries. Um has that also helped you kind of hone your skills and and kind of you know be prepared for different um, scenarios and conditions and different grass um you know different layouts and and so on how has that kind of contributed to you know just ticking all the boxes on your golf game yeah i mean you know i was born in germany but honestly speaking i never really you know yes when you're three four you your goal is to hit the ball you know i wasn't thinking about grass so you know my golfing sort of journey in a sense really started when i moved to england and through amateur golf going through that you know you play golf in europe you see different courses different layouts but when i sort of moved to dubai that was a very big step because you're sort of exposed to all these incredible facilities and courses yeah and you have yeah. such a wider reach of practice facilities 
things that I never really got to practice, especially when I was living in, you know, the UK and it's raining or it's snowing and you don't practice that much during the winter because you just genuinely can't. Here it's almost all year, all day, every day, you can practice, you can go out, you can grind it out and that is something that definitely has improved my game. You know, I can't lie because I am very blessed in that I can go out on the 16th of December, wear a t-shirt and just enjoy my round, you know? So it makes a big difference, I must admit. But, you know, just playing golf, playing tournaments, that already exposes you to so many different environments and just competing under every sort of pressure and tournament you can get already shapes you into something that's going to help you achieve sort of what you want to in the future. And I was actually, my next question was going to be how beneficial has staying in, you know, um, Dubai been? Because I feel like, you know, I was, I was obviously there for the last two events on the, on the European tour and it just feels so convenient for a golfer. It feels like the most convenient place to be because like you mentioned, the, the, the quality of facilities are outstanding and then coupled with just unreal golf courses with the perfect greens, the perfect fairways. Like, it just feels like the perfect place to be at as an elite player. I mean, honestly speaking, it is, you know. Um, that's sort of, you know, one of the reasons I moved here. You know, it's it's just so yeah. accessible. You know, I keep saying that because that realist... And I think you saying it's very, you know, hmm, easy at times is true because you, you're yeah. always surrounded with perfect weather, great conditions, great practice facilities... You, you're pretty close to different courses, so you can always sort of switch it up. You have some great players coming down here, especially when you're sort of getting towards those European tour events. You sort of, you're surrounded by the elite of the elite, and it does make you a better golfer, I think, and it's something that I'm forever going to be grateful for, because I know I sort of got a needle in a haystack because it was just a blessing by itself, but yeah, it, it makes a big difference, and it's been great. And, you know, you mentioned being surrounded by, you know, the elite of the elite. Do you have any standout conversations or, you know, interactions with certain players that you, that kind of sticks in your head and it's something that you always kind of go back to in the memory bank and think, you know, and, and draw inspiration from some of these conversations? Um, I mean, I've got this one conversation sort of in my head. It wasn't, it actually wasn't in Dubai, so, um, but I have had plenty, um, but it was at um, one of the events in Saudi, I had the pleasure of speaking with Lydia Ko. So that was sort of like a dream come true in a wow moment because, you know, speaking to a player of her stature and her success and her history was pretty damn cruel. <laughs> and she was really sweet and she really took the time with me and she was really supportive and she answered some questions I had regarding, you know, the pro game and advice. And, you know, at the time I was actually going through a shoulder injury. <laughs> I posted it quite publicly on my Instagram about that because it was a tough situation. And I really struggled, you know, making that decision. It was either sort of putting health first or performance in that situation. And I think her consultation in that sense really did help and it made a difference. And knowing that there's players out there who sort of go through the same things and have so much experience and history in the game is very inspiring in that sense and it's a moment that's probably going to stick with me for a long time and i mean lydia ko has also kind of you know similar you know she was pro at a, at a very young age as well so i suppose it's also that relatability and the fact that she's you know kind of gone through that same journey that you're going to now embark on and this is kind of a nice full circle moment for her probably to to kind of have that conversation with you yeah that, i i mean i hope so <laughs> um all i can say all i can say is she was super nice to me so um yeah <laughs> i'm assuming maybe <laughs> <laughs> and you know along along with like lydia what other professional golfers are you know some of your role models or players that you looked up to you know are there more on the lady side or do you have a few on the men's side obviously that you you maybe looked up to and, and drew inspiration from mm, well, i mean you know the outright basic um generalized very common one would of course be tiger woods um so i'm not going to get into that too much because you know tiger's like tiger's the goat we'll just we'll just leave him okay <laughs> but um you know in women's golf i think especially sort of play now that i've sort of played on tour 
I think you sort of respect the players on tour a lot more, even at times, because yeah. you sort of realize how tough it can actually be out there being a female golfer, struggling with those misconceptions about our golf and, you know, seeing how good some of these players really are. Um, I think I've not had the pleasure of meeting her yet, but, you know, Nelly Korda, I've looked up for her, up to her for a few years now. And, you know, she's she's a very similar stature you know she's blonde she's tall you know we have similar swings so I sort of like looking up to people I can see myself being people that I sort of can compare to myself and you know she's a great golfer especially this year you know but even beforehand she's always been a great character out on the golf course so I've always looked up to her (laughs) and you mentioned your golf swing you know it is pretty much textbook in in what it is you know it's like the perfect positions and and you can't really fault it how hard has the training been, you know, over like from, for instance, 2020 when you were still then like an amateur and how you've kind of put in that hard work with your coach up until now? Like how, you know, what's kind of changed in that sense between the conversation between you and your coach? Because I feel like there must be that difference in, you know, even if it's just the words being used, like there's a different mentality when you, you kind of made that shift now to professional golf? Yeah, um, you know, I think I've had my, well, first of all, I've been working with my team and my my golf coach, Rob, um, so Rob Goldup is my gym instructor, gym coach. He, I've worked with him for a few years now, and then Hugh Marr is my swing coach, and, you know, they've always sort of been coupled together for me, and I've been, that's like my very inner circle of my team, you know, and I've been working with them yeah. for a few years now, and, it's been great. I think, especially process wise, things have changed over the last few years, but um, they're both so professional and they have experience out on tour. So I think basically from the minute I started working with them, we were very clear about the stages of my progress as a golfer. So, you know, one of the first things Hugh said to me when I first saw him, he said, right now we're working on your swing. You know, we're improving things, we're optimizing things, but maybe next year, maybe in two years, maybe in six months, we're going to be going into this new stage and that's going to be refining. And it's probably, it's definitely the most difficult stage because you can't necessarily look for degrees and angles and positions anymore because you're really just trying to play golf. But it's also the most effective stage because when you're out there on the golf course and you sort of have to rely on your swing entirely and just feels and what you know and your conceptions of your own body that's a whole different time, you know, that's a whole different thing because once you're out there and you're thinking about positions and all the things you sort of grew up playing as and doing as an amateur, you sort of have to step out of that process entirely and just sort of focus back on the things you, you know, the, the core of golf, you know, you have to sort of focus yeah. on that shot and what you want to do and how you're going to do it. <laughs> and I think it's it's very interesting sort of discovering that for myself over the last let's just say over the last year, I think. And yeah, I think my team's really helped me with that and making it, it's it's made me a better golfer, that's for sure, because swing at times, yes, it's great, but you can play really good golf with a not so picturesque swing. You can, and there's people winning and succeeding with it. And that's an important lesson I had to learn because I was always, as a kid, you know, you're always trying to get like the perfect swing. You're always trying to, become yeah. like I don't know reflect the swing of your idol whatever it is so when my when Hugh originally went Kiara no one cares like it doesn't make a difference <laughs> I was so taken aback because I was like well you know this person is swinging it there and that angle there and it's more aesthetically pleasing and he was like Kiara is it gonna get you the whole the ball in the hole faster and I was like hmm, maybe not and that was sort of the end of that conversation <laughs> so yeah it's it's definitely i think you're sort of seeing how the processes definitely change and that golf is just so intricate and it's basically not all mentality but attitude and understanding of yourself is probably one of the biggest parts of it and going into to this year you obviously had a great you know 2021 with all the you know from your results in the let axis and some of the results on the let What's your goals for 2022? You know, where do, what, where do you see Kiara going? And do you feel like you're going to 
kind of keep everything quite similar to what it is now and you know there's not much to change and is it just kind of again executing on the processes you have currently i think you pretty much nailed it with the executing the processes i have you know because when you're planning your season you're you're always sort of thinking about the processes and the different phases of it of course right now you know i'm i'm in off season so i'm still sort of gym work is very heavy right now so you're really focusing on your body and your health and then over the next phase will definitely be sort of season prep and that will be a different stage but goals for the season I think a lot of it will be mentality based understanding based because you know as much as I want to grow as much as I can as a golfer and I want to be out there and I want to be the most knowledgeable about myself I want to know how I react to scenarios I want to see how I react under pressure and I want to handle those situations well so I think that will sort of be number one number two of course that physical actual success of course is something that you always search for so I think you know my my goal of course is to win but if we, that's something you can't necessarily rely on so I'm going to be doing everything I can to achieve it over the next few months um so yeah that's basically it I can't necessarily be like okay this and this because that's sort of something I internalize with myself and my team but um it's an exciting season and I'm really really urging and egging to get back out there <laughs> And do you think, you know, being 15, year, 15 years old, does that also in a way take some of the pressure away of trying to do everything very quickly because you have so much time ahead of you in a way, you know, normally like let's say there's a, a golfer who's an amateur turns pro at 23 and then you have all this, you know, getting a, a card and, and all these things to do and it almost feels like time's running out once you you're passing the ages of like 25 you know the, the pressure starts mounting because you need to start ma- earning a living for instance but now you at 15 do you feel like that that's um uh something just to to ease the pressure and feel like okay i don't have to be rushing you know i'm i'm right here i just need to improve as much as i can yeah i mean to be honest with you that's sort of one of the reasons we decided for me to turn pro quite early on because it does sort of let me we sort of come to terms with the fact we sort of said that I'm almost like a, a schooling professional I'm sort of understanding the ropes and getting to know myself and the tour and sort of my aspirations and my understanding of the sport so it's I'm not it's a good thing you know I'm not financially supported by the sport just yet you know I still live with my parents I still go to school I still am a normal child in that sense um, but at the same time, it, it's, it's still a lot of pressure at times because when you do turn pro at a young age, a lot of people will sort of want to see proof and understand why, yeah. you know, a lot of people want to understand. I think that's sort of the, re- the word. Um, and it, you have to be very careful that you're very safe and secure in what you believe in yourself and like in what you believe of yourself. So it, it's a step you have to be careful with. It definitely took a lot of consideration because I was very afraid at times that, you know, I don't want to be going in and sort of going too fast. I don't want to be there and not be ready for it and then sort of crumble and lose that passion, that love and that yeah. sort of aspiration for the future. So that's sort of why the LAT access and that sort of season of preparing and playing on those tours helped because it almost secured my understanding and my belief in why I wanted to turn professional. It wasn't for other people and it wasn't to sort of go with the norm and go with the standard and go to university and then do this, you know. I still have all those opportunities and that's something people shouldn't forget, you know. I'm 15 um, and I have almost sort of three years to figure out if this is the right thing if I can make it you know if I'm seeing myself progress the way I want to and then I can sort of still make that final decision so you know I'm 100% committed to being professional and you know don't get me wrong but it's it it is a lot easier you know being 15 and playing as a professional rather than being someone who just got out of uni has student debt and is now trying to finance their life I must agree yeah and yeah I think that's the thing it's like it's a completely different pressure and I think sometimes if you you know it just depends on the hand you dealt and some people deal with it really well and some people just don't I think at, at the level that when you turn pro everyone's a really great golfer I think it just comes down to execution and mentality you know everyone hits the ball well everyone 
basically hits the perfect golf shot when they're playing it's just it's such a tough um thing because there's so many variables and you know it just depends on on your mentality um my last golf related question is you know what will be your first event um i'm not too sure on your schedule but what what's your first event of the year and kind of how have you structured your schedule if you've done that already I mean, first of all, I just want to sort of clarify, you know, with my schedule going into the 2022 season, no one is planning on me or like playing a full LAT or LATX as schedule, yeah. you know, because I do still go to school and um, I think it might be illegal <laughs> for me not to, you know, be attending school. <laughs> so um, I think my focus is still sort of balancing that very well, but you know, hopefully I'll be sort of starting the season towards March, you know, um, but with COVID, it's very difficult to plan, you know, some things are still needing to be confirmed and, you know, it's still sort of a work in progress at the moment, but, you know, I'll be sort of playing at hopefully what the structure we've sort of organized for myself is that hopefully I'll be sort of be playing two, three events back to back, sort of flying back to Dubai and making sure that I have sort of those breaks to recuperate and get that education and, you know, reanalyze things and then heading back out. But, you know, I'll be updating, you know, my followers on my platform in the next few weeks and hopefully um, sort of produce a good schedule um, going forward. And with all those golf questions out of the way, I want to know, you know, what do you do besides golf? I think, you know, it's easy for golfers to just be in. I know I, we're like semi obsessive and, you know, we're always searching for answers and sometimes we don't need to be. But, you know, what do you do besides golf to keep your mind busy, to keep your mind off the game? Is there certain hobbies that kind of you keep um, as a priority just to, to keep that healthy balance between golf, which is now your work, and, you know, some of the other things in your life? I mean, I, yeah, golf is very time consuming. Um, if we were looking for short term results, probably the wrong school, uh, wrong sport. But um, I think for me, you know, I sort of do the same things every teenager does, you know, I go to school, I watch a movie, I listen to music, I read, I, you know, play school sports, I hang out with friends, um, but it's a little different because I'm doing everything to sort of optimize my success as an athlete at the same time. So, yeah. you know, dedication and sort of the structure of my life is definitely a little different, you know, my, the type, the spare time I have is a little less than other teenagers, which is, you know, expected, but I think, you know, especially over the last year, we've sort of done a really good job at managing that so far, um, sort of making sure I do have the time to sort of relax and have downtime and see my friends and be a normal kid. Um, and that's a really big and really important aspect of it because you don't want someone to sort of lose that passion because they feel like they're sacrificing themselves for the sport. Um, but I, I don't know. <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> I just live. <laughs> Yeah, because I think sometimes it's so, um, I th you know, I, obviously I've been around a lot of professionals of late as well. And sometimes it's almost like we get so consumed by the thought of I should be improving, I should be improving, I should be improving. And I think, yeah, obviously at your age, I think maybe you still being in school is a good thing because it kind of forces you to, to not be 100% focused on golf all the time. Yeah, definitely. Um, I've always been a little special <laughs> in that regard, you know. Um, I've always sort of loved going to school for that very reason, you know. Especially yeah. being a younger child, you know, when you're eight, nine, ten, sort of taking golf somewhat seriously at this point, dreaming of becoming a professional golfer, whatever it was when I was, you know, that young. But it's difficult to sort of balance, I must agree, because a lot of the time you're sort of just very consumed with the sport because you're thinking you know I should be doing this why am I doing that instead yeah. and you sort of want to progress as quickly as humanly possible um but you know school it, it really does help me because I've I like to separate them I have sort of golf Chiara and mm. normal Chiara is very different you know when I'm on the golf course I have to be a lot maturer I have to think about things I have to think ahead and yes that does sometimes translate into you know outside Chiara but when I'm at the golf course, I come to practice, you know, I'm not necessarily necessarily there to socialize. You know, I'm not necessarily there to, you know, run around and listen to music. You know, I'm there to grind it out and to become the best 
professional golfer I can be and, you know, be the best version of myself. And then when I'm in school, I can be a regular 15 year old who makes stupid decisions and complains about maths, you know, like it's, 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 uh, that's basically as deep as it gets. <laughs> and I suppose this question is more, you know, on the, the side of your leisure is, you know, what's Kiara watching right now in terms of, I, I suppose Netflix and streaming has become such a huge part of everyone's lives. So what, what's been on your watch list of late and, you know, what's been keeping your mind busy besides, you know, golf? on Netflix or whatever streaming platform you you use? First of all, um, I saw like an announcement that the PGA Tour is going to be on Netflix or something, which I yes. thought was really cool. Uh, can't wait to watch that. I don't know when it's going to be out there, but I'm really looking forward to watching it. Um, you know, a lot of YouTube-based content actually, because YouTube-based content usually is some of the golf content that you'll sort of have available to you very easily. You know, lots of Peter Finch, um what else what else do i watch i watch a lot of true crime if anyone's interested <laughs> um okay but, um yeah you know regular things whatever it is um yeah i like to read a lot um a lot of things i'm doing you know sometimes i'll read performance books or just a random book that gets my mind off things but very all over the place to be honest <laughs> nothing too too focused on like a certain channel or a certain like <laughs> and i think uh to close off this um you know episode firstly thank you again for making time um what do you think you know if you weren't a golfer let's say you had a choice right now and golf wasn't an option what would you choose to do what's your dream job you don't have to be good at it right now or have any kind of relation to it but let's say dream dream kiara besides golf what do, what are you picking um, my dad used to say I'd make a very good lawyer because I'm very good at arguing. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, that was sort of when I was, I don't know, when I thought, you know, golf was just going to be a hobby at that point when I was like eight. I thought, you know what, <laughs> I'll be a lawyer. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, it's very difficult to answer that question because, you know, I'm already a professional golfer you know like I'm already technically working so it's like I gotta look back six years and try and figure out what I was thinking um I don't know I was probably trying to be like a princess or something <laughs> uh, I'm sure I'm sure Disney will will look into that and you might get a pr the princess Golfing of golf princess princess Sarah. Sarah. Mm -hmm. lovely <laughs> but um yeah hundred percent um but yeah thanks Kiara. i think uh you know it's it's obviously inspiring for a lot of people to see your journey come into fruition and see this you know firstly you've already achieved some great results and hopefully you can build on from that and you know you obviously have a great support base and we hope you know you can reach your potential that we we all feel you can and yeah thanks for for coming on thank you so much for having me i wish you a nice evening <laughs>